Hey, uh, happy Labor Day. If you've got a Bible, go ahead and open up to Job 42. That's where we'll be at today, Job 42. If you're new to church like me, the first time I saw that, I was like, isn't it Job? Right, we all speak English here, right? So you can open up to Job if you want to, too. Uh, Job 42, verses 1 to 6, where we'll be at. If you don't have a Bible, we have one in the seat in front of you. That's our gift to you. Feel free to take that with you, and we'll be turning to page 446. As Graham mentioned, my name is Justin Chandler. I'm the lead pastor here at Harbor Trinity Church, and so glad that you're spending part of your Labor Day weekend with us and the kickoff of Fantasy Football Weeks, which we're about ready to get into. Here we go. Um, but before we get too far... Over the last few months during the summer, what we've been doing is working through this book called The Knowledge of the Holy. It's written by A.W. Tozer. Uh, It was about 70 years ago. And the heart of this book was to bring out the attributes of God, things that God has revealed about himself, how we can come to know God, and how you and I are both built for and meant to know God. And this series along the way has had so many little surprises that have just been really special for me, even just in the last month, that about a month ago... Uh, When we were here, we had returned from a trip to Colorado, and that week during the reading, one of the analogies that A.W. Tozer used was of someone, if they consider the scope of the forest and how big it is, you often don't think about it when you're just walking along and you're with your family and everything's fun, but if you were to lose one of the members of your family, all of a sudden the forest got a lot bigger. Well, we had just hiked Pikes Peak that week before, and so it was just this easy way of going like, oh, thanks, God, that was kind of fun. Fast forward a couple of weeks, we start talking about the sovereignty of God and how is it possible for God to be there from the beginning and the end and to know all the things that occur and for you and I to still have choices. And so one of the analogies he used was imagine an ocean liner departing from one destination and arriving to the other. If we're on the boat, we get all kinds of freedom on the boat, but we are going to the destination that the captain has chosen. And it was a way for us to say, here's how the sovereignty of God works. Well, a friend of mine that week had just gone onto the icon of the seas, which is the new biggest, best, largest boat that's ever been created. And I unintentionally became an advertisement for them. So if you booked a cruise, like use referral code Justin or something. But there was all of this that became a part of that story too. Last week, we hosted a welcome brunch, which is a once a month gathering we have for anybody who's new to our church to hear our story, connect with our staff, uh, share kind of what brought them and let them know here's some easy ways for you to be involved in. And there was someone at the church who came up to me and they're like, hey, Justin, you've never met me before, but I got the email and I wanted to come here. I was actually a part of Harbor Trinity years ago, uh, but my husband and I, we moved to Texas, but then as his health started declining, we moved back here uh, to California and he recently passed away, but I decided I was going to come to church today because a friend of mine had invited me to come and she said, I want to show you this book. And she pulls out a copy of the Knowledge of the Holy that looks just like this one, the very one that we had had on the screen. Now, if you were to buy this on Amazon today, this version would cost you more money. It's not more special. It's just blue and yellow. I've had it for like 20 years. So she's like, when we came to Harbor Trinity, the pastor at the time gave us this book and he wrote in the front of it, he's like, to the two of you as you're getting ready, this is one of my favorite authors and one of my favorite books and just wishing you the best in your marriage. Now that pastor, his name is Connie Salios. And Connie Salios was the pastor at Harbor Trinity Church from 1969 to 1976, 50 years ago. So who would have thought that 50 years ago, there was a pastor at this church that looked to somebody who was getting married and said, this is one of my favorite books, one of my favorite authors, wishing you the best. Fast forward 50 years, the pastors stop wearing ties, they have spiky hair and unshaved beards on their face, and look at how far God has come, right? And so to have these moments of that and to say, man, all along the way, God has been doing something special. Now you could say, those are fun coincidences, and I'll give you that. But I will tell you, the number of coincidences that I've had since believing in God has skyrocketed. And just to have these moments where it's like, if you want to call it that, that's fine. But my percentages have increased in what God has done. And so as we get ready to conclude this series today, we're going to put a line on the screen. It's one line. It kind of ties the whole series together, even if this is your first time today. And here's the one line that we'll have for you. And it's this, that God is not a secret. God is is not a secret. Both in who he is and what he's like and how he's revealed to himself, God is not a secret. And as we begin, uh, let's take a moment to pray. Glory to God on high. God, we praise you, we bless you, we worship you for your great glory. God, there's been moments where I've said things that I thought I understood, but I understood them not. Things that were too wonderful for me, which I didn't know, Things that I had heard of you by the hearing of my ear, but now my eyes have had the ability to see. And God, there's been moments where it felt like I've just been 
dust and ashes. So God, in the moments where I shouldn't speak, would you lay your hand upon my mouth in the moments where I've spoken and, but would not be able to go any further. But also, God, in those times where there's a musing of a fire burned in our heart, God, would we be able to speak of you? Would we not keep silent lest we offend another generation amongst us? But God, would you choose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, the weak things of the world to confound the mighty? And, O oh Lord, would you forsake us not? God, would you allow you, us to show forth your strength into our generation and for your power for everyone that's to come? Would you raise up a generation of prophets and seers in your church who will magnify your glory and through your almighty spirit restore to your people the knowledge of the holy? And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. They say one of the fastest ways to spread news is to tell a secret. Whether that's in your work or in your life, but it is especially true at church. So what happens? You'll go to somebody and they'll be like, hey, I've got a secret. Don't tell anybody. And when you tell the secret, what happens? Somehow somebody found out. And then one of the things that church will do, because we're not immune because it's all people who show up, one of the things that church will do would be like, hey, there's a prayer request. I don't want you to share it with anybody, but we really want to be praying for this person. So here's this prayer request, but it's a secret. Don't share it. And the next thing you know, that person will be like, hey, there's a prayer request. You can't share it with anybody, but it's a secret. There's a prayer request. It's a really big deal. So I want you to be praying for them. So here's this prayer request. Don't tell anybody. Next thing you know, this person, hey, there's this prayer request. I heard it from somebody, but it's a secret. You can't tell. And now all of a sudden, this prayer request has gotten really far. And it wasn't in the name of praying, but it was in the name of like getting some stuff further away. And so we'll do that innocently. But you and I, as people, we love secrets. We love it when they're like, hey, there's this new stock that's getting ready to rise. Don't tell anybody, but we're going to buy in low and we're going to make tons of money. You'll see that about every time a new cryptocurrency comes out. Somebody's like, this is the one. You can buy it for the 10 millionth percent of a penny, and we're all going to be gabillionaires, right? We can't pronounce the name of it, but we're all going to win off of that crypto. If there's a new restaurant that gets open and you go there for the first time, you're like, there's no weights, there's no lines, we are in the know, this is going to be amazing. Look at how delicious this is. Don't tell anybody. Or if it's like a band, you'll have this moment where you're like, we have found this great music that no one knows about. We're on the inside. We're amazing. We're hipsters. Everybody's like, wait till everybody catches up. And then you have this moment where the band makes it big, right? And what does everybody say? Oh, I was listening to them before they were big. I loved them before they were, I've been loving them from the beginning. We'll play all those secrets. This week, or yesterday actually, a group of friends of mine in the neighborhood, we had our fantasy football draft. If you don't like fantasy football or sports in general, I'll see you in two minutes. To those of you who remotely care, we had a fantasy football draft, and here's how it started. It was in somebody's backyard, and it was going great there. One of the guys in our neighborhood is like a sports agent, so he's like, hey, I got this guy. He's got a house down at the beach. We can all go down to the beach. It's going to be amazing. So we go down to the beach. It's going to be a great time for all these different guys to, you know, draft imaginary football teams. So when we arrived there, the big question was, like, what's the draft order? What number pick do I get amongst 12? Am I 1 to 12? And the commissioner was like, and this is ridiculous. Now that I'm saying it out loud, we're like, can you believe we're doing all this? So the commissioner's like, I'm not telling you guys, show up to the beach, everyone's going to be there. So we get around, he's like, hey, here's a meeting, blah, blah, blah. gets everybody together. He's like, we're going to have this competition. And he's like, the way we're going to determine the draft order is this going to competition, whoever gets the lowest score gets to be number one, and so on. And so here's the different competitions. It's like the Olympics at the beach. So I looked at it, and I'm like, I'm going to be honest with you, man, I'm not doing none of that. Like, I don't know if it's because I'm grown. I was like, but I'm not in, right? So I'll play along, and there was a point where I'm like, hey, I'm just a gentleman. I'm going to go. I'll be last. I'm totally fine with that. So we go sit inside. There's these other sub-contests that you can do to get your score even lower. And so as we sit around, he's like, all right, here's the ranking. He goes through 1 to 12. Last place, Justin Chandler. And I'm like, I won last year. I'm going to beat every one of you guys from last place. Like, you just need to know. So there's this huge discussion last year about kickers in fantasy football. Again, we've got a minute left before I move on. But for kickers, we had this huge argument where it was like, we're not going to get kickers. Kickers are out. Oh, kickers. So he sits down, and he's the leading voice of this. And he's like, kickers are coming back. They're coming back this year. Oh, riot. And he was like the primary voice of get him out. He's like, here's the kicker. He's on the screen. His name was Shane Graham. He was a kicker for the Bengals most prominently. He had some other different teams. And he's like, guys, 
congratulations on your fantasy football draft. Shane Graham, you know, 15-year NFL veteran. I'm going to be calling out the draft this year. That whole competition that you just went through doesn't matter. Hope you had a really great time. I'm actually going to choose 1 to 12 who wins. I've got all of your names. Here we go. So he shakes up the jar. He gets ready to shake it. And then as he pulls the name out, you know whose name was first? Justin Chandler. Ah! And I, I'm telling you in the house, I was like, oh, I ran out of the house and I was coming back in and there'd be some random moments at the night where I was like, hey guys, let me tell you about God. All right, because there's this thing where like the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Who won? That guy's in last place. Let me tell you a little something about God. And it was this moment where it was fun. They all know I'm a pastor. They all know I work here. Some of them can hear right now and some of them are watching online. Shouts to the Hillcrest Bros. But you have this moment where even for him, it's like, what's the draft order? It's a secret. I'm not telling anybody. And why didn't he tell anybody? Because when the big reveal came out that Justin Chandler was going first and is going to be first again, he wanted to hold that. So we'll play that all the time. If you're new to church, one of the things that shows up, if you've ever been new to church before, sometimes it feels like a secret handshake. That people will say things or say things out loud. You're like, I don't understand that statement. Or it'll be, hey, we all know this story about, and you're going, I don't know that story at all. And you could say, man, I've been around church for five years, and I don't know the story of whoever. And so there are moments where this can start to feel like a secret handshake. But the, one of the things that God has done is he has revealed what he is like. He's revealed how we can know him. He's revealed how we can respond. He's revealed how we can grow to know God more. And that is not a secret. So the hope of our time today is even to say, so how exactly would we do that or how could we pursue it? Uh, A.W. Tozer shared this quote. We'll put it on the screen for you to kind of anchor our time together. He says, to know God is at once the easiest and the most difficult thing in the world. To know God is at once the easiest and the most difficult thing in the world. And if you were to look at the topics we've covered this summer, we said why we must think rightly about God, how we talk about God incomprehensible that we'll never really be able to get to know all of him, the Holy Trinity, how he's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We talked about God's self-existence, his self-sufficiency, the eternity of God, God's infinitude, the immutability of God, the divine omniscience, the wisdom of God, the omnipotence of God, the divine transcendence, God's omnipresence, God's faithfulness, goodness, justice, mercy, grace, love, holiness, and the sovereignty of God. So if you hear any of those topics, you're like, yep, there's the secret thing. I don't know what any of those words mean. Available on YouTube. But in all of that, like we could go through all of that and you're like, that is hard. And yet if we were to walk into any of the classrooms where any of the kids are in right now, you know what we could do? We could walk into that room and say, let me tell you something about God. And you know what they would get? They would understand Because God is both able to be understood by this kid, and then you could take the smartest person in the world and say, in knowing God, you can spend the rest of your life studying him, and you will never reach the end. That there will always be something more for you to learn and for to grow in. And so to know him is both the easiest thing in the world, and it is the most difficult thing in the world. And this we enter into. So as we look at the book of Job, the book of Job is fascinating. If you know nothing about it, we can call him Job too, but in the book of Job, or if the only thing you know about the book of Job is the first Mission Impossible movie, let's set some context. So in the book of Job, it's one of the oldest in the Bible, it's one of the oldest people that we have record of in the scriptures, and the book of Job starts like this, Job chapter 1, here's what it says, that there was a man who lived in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, so think he's just the best guy. Like, there's nothing to hold against him. He's good in every way, blameless and upright. One who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people in the East. So in the area that he lived in, not only is he the best, but he's the most powerful and he's the richest. Job was the man. And so the Bible starts in this way of saying, here's this person, and he's the best. And literally in the next verses, Job loses everything. He loses all of his children. He loses all of his possessions. He loses his home. Everything in Job's life is gone. In the next chapter, as that concludes, Job still got his body, but then Job's body starts to break out with sores. Imagine like boils on every part of his body. And so now he's got his body, but his body is failing and broken. The only thing that Job has left is his wife. And Job chapter 2, verse 9 says this, Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. Love marriage. Right? Like if this is 
what all you've got left. Here's the one person I love and adore and who's still close to me. And so you look to your wife and you're like, we've lost everything. Everything is gone. Look at my like arms. Look at my body. And your wife or your spouse looks at you and is like, are you really going to keep doing this? Just die already. You're like, that's it. This is what I got, God? And so here's where Job starts to live. Again, knowing God is the easiest and the most difficult thing. The next 35 chapters of the book of Job is everyone in his life telling him, here's why this happened. So if you've ever asked the question, why are these things happening to me? If you want an exhaustive study, just read Job. Because someone will come in and they'll say, hey, here, this is why it happened. And Job will go, I don't know, I don't know about that. And someone else will come in, here's why it happened. I don't know about that. Here's why this happened. I don't know about that. Friends, family, wise people, all of them are coming around. And then in Job 38, God responds. So there are 37 chapters of here's what happened and here's everybody's thoughts about why. And in Job 38, God responds. And God just starts to ask questions back to Job. And God's questions to Job are, where were you when the foundations of the earth were made? Where were you when the universe was created? Where were you when the animals were born? Where were you when this random deer just had a baby? Where were you when the bird was flying in its nest? Where were you as the waves of the ocean were pouring forth? Where were you when the lion roams about and I know its exact direction? He started asking all of those questions. And you could tell Like, God raised the stake a lot. And so then what does God, how does Job respond? Job 40, verses 3 to 5, we'll put on the screen. Job says this, Then the Lord answered Job and said, Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once, and I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. Job's response is, man, I asked a question, my bad. Like, I'm not talking anymore. I'll put my hand over my mouth. If you've ever been a little kid... And you asked the wrong question to a parent. And the parents started responding. And they were like, what about this? And you're like, I did not mean it. Right? You just got home from work, my bad. If you have a sibling who asked a question, you're like, why are you saying that to dad? He just got home. Why would you do that to mom? Like, you could feel this. And Job says, my bad, God. I shouldn't have asked any questions. I'm just going to put my hand over my mouth now. God responds and says, hey, you asked the questions. Let's go ahead and stand back up. He says, rise up like a man. And I'm like, oh, boy. And so then he says, now I'm going to start to respond. And God responds all the way through to chapter 42. And this is where we begin, all right? So if you have your Bible, Job 42, we're going to read verses 1 to 6. It says that Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is it that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear and I will speak. I will question you, and you will make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. What he said is this question of God is like, here and I will speak. I will question you and make it known. That's what God said. And so Job's response to him was, is in verse 5, and I love this verse. He says, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes have seen you. See, one of the things that's true is you could show up to this room for the rest of your life and hear a lot of stuff about God. And you could hear a lot of stuff about church, and you could hear a lot of stuff about the Bible, and you could hear a lot of stuff about Christianity and never really know it yourself. And that's the trap that we could all fall into. This, like, I've heard it, I've heard a lot of it, I can answer all of the right questions, and yet I don't really know. And here's Job, one of the most holy, upright, blameless people who had amassed all kinds of possessions, who people would say, God is surely working in your life. And Job, at the end of it, would have said, I spent my entire life hearing about God and never really seeing or knowing him. There's two other English translations of the Bible that are just incredible. We'll put these on the screen for you, too, alongside that first one. Job 42.5 in the NIV says, My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. The message, which is kind of a modern translation and uses some of our language, puts it like this. I admit I once lived by rumors of you. Now I have it all firsthand from my own eyes and ears. To say that we had lived on this way of following Jesus that was All of these rumors, all these whispers, all these things, it feels like a secret handshake, but we're saying all the right stuff. And we'll, you know, we used to walk in and say hello, and now we say, bless you, brother. And we're like, what does that even mean? And so we'll start to do all of this stuff. And he said, I had lived my life that way, but now I know you. And what does he know about God? That God was with him when he had everything, and God was with him when he lost everything. And while he's been asking the question, God, why did this happen? 
here's how God has revealed himself. And as, as much as we'll continue to emphasize, there's this part of it where we can know God like we can read a Wikipedia page. And to say, here's kind of the details, here's the facts, here's the way that I could tell others. And yet we were never designed to live with and to know God in that way. Tozer continues and said, God's a person and can be known in increasing degrees of intimate acquaintance as we prepare our hearts for the wonder. To say that you can know God more today than you knew him when you walked in, than when you know him when you complete the day, and to say that every day of your life you can know God more, and God is intended to be known more like that. That it was never meant to be like, I've got all that I need to be able to do whatever I need to do here, and then we'll just do whatever we want. It was meant to be that the infinite, massive, gigantic God of the universe We can know him and know him like we know our friends. Know him and have that kind of conversation. When I'm running around and I'm razzing my friends because I got first place when I was last, right? There's a knowledge and there's a friendship there that wasn't available eight years when I moved in. But now when they're all thinking they're, you know, going to be the man, I'm like, who's the man now, right? There's a different friendship that's come. And so to say in your knowledge of God that there's points where it feels like we're stumbling, where it's not easy, it feels awkward, which is true for every relationship. But to say that there will grow a way in your relationship with God that starts to feel more easy, starts to feel more repeatable, starts to feel like you're dialoguing with a friend. Jesus himself said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, see him. And you could look at it and you'd be like, my heart is not pure. I got stuff going on this week. You should, you know, if we played a movie, I'd be embarrassed, right? You could say that. And our purity of heart is never measured by how did we do on the scale? What gives you and I a pure heart? It's our relationship with Jesus and how he said that our hearts have been made pure by the sacrifice of Christ. So by living and knowing Jesus, I now get to see God. He has made a way that previously was not available. We'll see him. Not just words, not just services, not just rumors, not just facts. You can see and know God because God is not a secret. Paul the Apostle later on would say in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall fully know, even as I have been fully known. There is this part that feels like if you've ever looked at a really dirty mirror before, it's like, I can see me in there, but it's hard to see. And there are so many times when we understand God and his attributes, it's like, I can kind of see the shape of something in there, and it says that we're going to continue to see better and better and better. It's going to start off blurry sometimes, but as we continue to know him to degrees, we're going to be able to know him better. And then it says of you and I that there will come a day where you breathe your last and you close your eyes. And when you open your eyes and see him, you will know him fully as he has fully known you. The one who created, formed, made, crafted you from the very beginning until today. When you open your eyes, you're going to see him and you're going to know him like that. That it's not just going to be a dim mirror anymore. And forever we will rule and reign with him. You and I can know God. There's two more quotes from Tozer and then one more thought. He says, we are Christians. We are the church. And whatever we do is what the church is doing. And any forward step in the church must begin with the individual. I don't know if you've ever thought about it like that, but to say, whatever you do, if you're a follower of Jesus and you call yourself a Christian, you are doing what the church is doing, capital C Church. And it's not just Church of Costa Mesa or Church of America or Western Church or whatever. Every Christian, whatever that Christian is doing is what the church is doing in the world. And then to think, what am I doing And how am I doing it? Because that ultimately is what the representation of a Christian is. And as we look at the things that are going on in a church, there's all kind of ways that we could begin, but every step that God has ever taken has always started with the individual. So it starts with you and it starts with me. And to each one of us being able to say, I want to know God and I want to know him more and I want to know him better and I want to be able to walk it forward and all the things that God is showing and revealing. Graham mentioned uh, about eight years ago, our family moved uh, from Springfield, Missouri to California. And there's a long story and so much that's involved in that. But one of the things that was true is about uh, 11 years ago, we were on, uh, Rachel had come out early for a friend's wedding, and I was flying with my oldest son, who was kind of a newborn at the time. So I flew later, and he was sleeping on my chest because it was past his bedtime as we were flying in to land uh, here in Orange County. And as we were landing... I had this moment where I could look out and I could see, you know, all the lights and whatever. And I had a point where I was like, God told me I would move here someday. 
And I and that I'm like, uh, here, God? Like, I know Rachel's from, like, the Central Coast, but, like, you want us to move back here? I've never lived west of Colorado, right? And so it's like, what, are, what is all that? So I land, you know, we're holding Jude, and I said to Rachel, I was like, I had this moment on the plane where I feel like God told me we're going to move here. And she's like, well, when you figure that out, let me know. And so we spent years kind of in this space of holding. And then in 2015, I resigned from a job that I had. And so we were in the, maybe this is the time. Maybe this is where God is going to lead. Maybe this is the part where he's going to bring us to California. And we spent the next year trying to go, what is God doing and where is it going and what's going to happen and how's that all going to work? And then as we arrived towards uh, the summer of 2016, uh, we had accepted a position. And as Graham said, yesterday, eight years ago, we drove this moving truck and parked in the driveway of the house that we had started renting. And there's a moment where you can say, man, for the last three to five years, I've been believing that this was true, but I'm seeing it with my eyes now. And when we had these little humans, when we were back in Missouri, we're like, all right, here's our house and our little United States puzzle. And here's all of the states we're going to drive through before we get to California. And this is where our new house is going to be. And for them to like be riding along with us and while we're driving all of these things over here, to pull into the driveway and to say, we made it, but we made it to an empty house. So what did we do? We opened the back up, we got the beds out, we put those on the ground, and then we're all hungry. So we drove over to Del Taco, got food, I put a blanket on the, the living room, we all sat down and we ate Del Taco on this blanket. And then once we were done, it was, well, we're done eating, we're not going to unpack until tomorrow. So let's just go to the ocean. And so we drove down to the ocean. All of us had our clothes on and our kids jumped into the water. And then they're like in the ocean, which if you've never seen the ocean or you can't remember what it was like to see the ocean for the first time, just invite a friend who doesn't live by it and watch what everybody's face does when they see the ocean for the first time or they watch the sunset for the first time or they hear the sound for the first time or those people who are like, I'm going to go surfing. Yeah. And then they get out there and just get totally wrecked. And you're like, super easy, right? So my three-year-old is like, I'm going to go out deeper. I'm like, I wouldn't do that, bro. Here's a surge. Bam, he gets bodied. And he comes out of it. And he's like, I don't like the ocean. I don't want to swim anymore, right? Like, (laughs) welcome to California, baby, right? So every year since then, we do the same thing. So this afternoon at our house, I'm going to get out that same blanket. We're going to put it in the middle of the living room. And all of us are going to eat on the floor. We have a a table now, in case you wonder. But we're all (laughs) going to be there. And what am I going to do? We're going to have a story where I get to tell my kids what God did eight years ago. Because none of them can understand it. Two of them weren't even born yet. But I'm going to say to little kids, like, here's a way that God guides and leads. And here's how he guided and led your mom. And Del Taco is absolutely ridiculous. But it's going to be this moment. It's like this thing for us to say every year we can point back and say, look at what God did. And oh, for you and me to have those kind of stories and those kind of lives and to live in such a way that even when we gather in here, we get to be the people who walk in and say, let me tell you something about what God did. And what does that do in you that starts to cause you to say, oh, man, I start to believe a little bit. Imagine what God could do for me. And as it starts in the individual, imagine what God would start to do, even in this room, just with us, if we started to be the people who say, I want to know God just a little bit more today, and I'm going to let him work and move in my life so that I experience him. And then we just start to tell the stories of, look at what God did. And it doesn't mean that we're free from moments where we don't doubt, because as much as I could say two years ago is when I started here, if you go back two and a half years ago, we were asking if maybe we missed it and we should go back to Colorado and move into my mom's house, because all of the signs were starting to say that maybe we missed it and it wasn't working out. And there are plenty of moments where we can quit right before God does what God does. And so to say all the things that I would have missed if I just would have said, yeah, it's not looking good. And oh, the things that Job could have missed simply because he said, oh, it's not looking good. And oh, the things that you and I could miss. But what if we're the people who know and believe God through no matter what happens? And we get to be the ones who say, I want to invite you to know God more. You little child who has no idea. And you most brilliant, most powerful person in the world. Each one of us has a space where we can enter in to be raised up as a mature disciple who intentionally helps people find and follow Jesus. Let's take a moment as we pray. I recognize that for some of us as we've come into the room today, that maybe that prayer would be the one that we would pray. The thing that we just mentioned is that as much as there's so much to be known, that maybe today would be the day where you say, I want to know God. 
And it would be the first time you ever said out loud, I want to be able to know God today. I want to know Jesus more today. I want to have a relationship with God. And it would be like what God did in my life over 20 years ago when I became a Christian for the very first time. Or maybe there's some of you who you lived on rumors, maybe you lived on facts, maybe you lived on the knowledge of God, but then you had, you were able to walk away and to go able to do other things and you went to other places and did all kinds of other stuff. But as God is bringing you back, like maybe it's part of why you're here today is where you would say, I walked away from God. Today would be a moment where you say, but I'm back because I want to know God again. And it would be as if you were starting all over. And so if that's you, either saying, I want to know God for the very first time, and I want to give my life to following him, or maybe you'd be making that decision as if it were brand new today, could you lift up your hand, because we want to take a moment where we pray for you, either for the very first time, or say it again. Yeah, it's each of you who are lifting your hands up. Thank you so much for that. Thanks to each of you who are lifting your hands. Here's what I invite you to do. There's a prayer that I'm going to pray out loud, that you can pray with me. You can echo it in your heart. You can say it out loud, whatever is best for you, and you can follow me as I pray. And here's what we'll say. Lord Jesus, thank you that you love me so much. I believe that you're the Son of God who died on the cross for my sins. And I now turn away from the sin in my life which has separated me from you. And if there's things in your life right now that you know have been keeping you from God or know have been pulling you away from God, you can make the decision to say, I want to turn away God from those things and I want to turn my life towards you. And as we turn our life and our heart towards God, we continue to pray. Thank you, Jesus, that you died for me so that I could be forgiven and set free. I now receive your forgiveness. I put my trust in you. I ask you to come into my heart by your Holy Spirit to be with me forever. I choose this day to follow you for the rest of my life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer, Graham mentioned it. But there's an info card in the seat in front of you. The very top box says, I decided to follow Jesus today. There is no power in putting your name on a card, but there is so much power in a proclamation and being able to say, here's what God did. And if you had time, we'd love to talk with you and pray with you after the service. If you don't have time, you can drop it in one of the boxes and we'll be sure to follow up with you. For the rest of us, If what God is doing in the world and what God is doing in the church and what God is doing in you and I, it it begins with each of us as an individual. And maybe you just want to say, I want to know God more today. I've been living on rumors. I've been living on whispers. I've been living on secret handshakes, it feels like, or just recalling the facts. But I want to see and know God with my eyes. Right? If your prayer would be that of Job's, of just, I've lived on the rumors, but now my eyes can see. If that's you, go ahead and lift up your hand because we want to take a moment where we pray for you. Yeah, to each of you who are lifting your hands up, thanks so much. And for all of us, and I have a dream for this church and a dream for each of us that what the Christian is doing is what the church is doing and whatever you're going to do today is what the church of Jesus is doing in the world. And oh, the stories we could tell of us being able to share with neighbors and friends, and co-workers, and our family. Here's how God has worked in my life, and imagine what God would do with that. The revival that God would bring to you, the revival you would bring to me, and to this church, and to our neighborhoods. And to that we pray. Jesus, I love you so much. And I'm thankful that we no longer have to ask the question, what is God like? Because even in Jesus, God has revealed himself to us by putting on human flesh and living amongst us, revealing the Father and empowering us with the Spirit, and we are able to know God. And so I pray for each of us today, those of us who are thousands of years removed from you walking on the earth, Jesus, your promise to every one of us remains the same, that the pure in heart will be able to see God. And so God, I pray on behalf of this room, we want to see you, God. And we want to know you, God. We want to have a knowledge of the holy that guides and shapes our lives. That's not just facts and rumors and whispers, but we have come to experience you, God. So would you reveal yourself to us? And would you empower your church by the power of the Holy Spirit to reveal that God is continuing to move, he's continuing to speak, he's continuing to act, and he is available to all who call upon him. And would we be those who call first and lead others to do the same. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.